You know, there's a great problem of movies, is that they're always old-fashioned. It takes too long to make a movie. By the time your idea is on the screen, it's already dead. Raging Bull is Martin Scorsese's best film, though not my favorite. It's an experimental biopic following Italian-American boxer Jake LaMotta, where boxing serves as a metaphor for his internal conflicts. What you mean to face? What? Jake is an angry, disturbed individual who cheats on his wife. He beats up his brother, who might be the only one in the world who tolerates him. Hell, he doesn't even like himself. What you mean with everything you got? Huh? What are you trying to prove? What does it prove? Jake does not believe he deserves happiness, and quite frankly, neither does the audience. <laughs> Raging Bull is a piece of work to sit through, but it is also meant to be cathartic. Marty cooked this one at the bleakest point in his life. He was newly divorced after having an affair with Liza Minnelli, who starred in his massive budget musical, which soon flopped. He was a massive addict, and it all escalated when he OD'd. That's when his friend, Bobby, visited him in the hospital and presented to him Lamotta's autobiography, telling him he wanted to make it with him. Martin resisted, but Robert got him to cave when they went on a vacation to unwind. Like the one that Marlon Brando played in On the Waterfront, an up-and-comer who's now a down-and-outer, and it went something like this. Martin Scorsese projected all his frustrations, angers, self-loathing, and regrets into this project, seeking penitence the only way he knew how, through the screen. Unflinching, uncompromising, the last great hurrah of the era of renegade cinema. No one ever shown this film to us liked it. One of my greatest and worst traits has been empathy. I just made two videos where I discuss escapism and how I've had a tendency to indulge in characters, good or bad, living vicariously through them. This, of course, is a needlessly convoluted way of saying I'm a big geek and I like stories, particularly character studies. I find the world we live in very strange, and it seems like the more time I spend in it, the less it makes sense. Stories, for brief moments, make it make sense. However, I do find an increasing urgency to criticize both my own world and the ones I indulge in, as the danger of ignoring the disparity in our circumstances become increasingly evident. Art goes through different movements, which reflect the issues and philosophies of their time and setting. The most recent trend I've observed, particularly in American film and television, is what I'd like to call White Guilt Cinema, or Sad King Cinema. What does that mean? What does that mean? White Guilt or Sad King Cinema is how I describe the phenomenon of stories centered around individuals, often white and or in positions of power, grappling with the burden of their atrocities. We've been getting a lot of these lately, particularly in 2023. The more I look into it, the more it is apparent that these films and TV shows are, in a cultural sense, fundamentally flawed, and their very existence represents the trappings of the industry from which they were birthed. One thing I've observed with European stories from the days of the ancient Greek theater is that they've always dealt with power. The comedies made fun of those in power, while the tragedies would be more serious introspective criticisms of these characters, often in pursuit of power. Based on the gods of the Greeks, these tales often depicted struggles of power with the ultimate goal of critiquing Greek society and the prevailing order. It's evident even from then that the people telling the stories found themselves at ethical odds with the society in which they lived, though they may have also been benefiting from it. Now I did not grow up with the Greeks. They invented gayness. I grew up in the Bibleists of belts, both of my parents being pastors' children, I have at least four godfather pastors, I've read the entire Bible, I was fed Bible stories quite literally before I could speak. But while I made my way through, the first figure I actually resonated with was King Solomon, particularly his essay Ecclesiastes. Now we're not talking about the misogyny and pro-slavery apologia of Proverbs, nor the strange erotic diversion that was Song of Solomon, 
Ecclesiastes, the translated Christian adaptation of the original Hebrew text at least, is an essay where the wealthiest man alive agonizes over how much he hates life. Teenage me found that kinda based. I was telling a friend about the connection I found with Sully, but he didn't get it. He just found the whole thing kinda funny. Oh no, I'm so wealthy. Whatever will I do with my money? Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. Solomon, the original sad king, was a man who had so little to worry about, he invented nihilism. I wasn't a wealthy king, I was a chronically anxious high schooler. But in the emptiness of Solomon's soul and the meaningless pursuit of material knowledge and power, I likely connected because of my increasing apathy towards high school and the empty promises of meritocracy and tradition. Fresh, uh, Shakespeare would soon take the tales of the Greeks and add a bit of complexity to the characters. Macbeth would forsake everything he has for power and isolate himself, leaving no one to blame but himself. King Lear would focus on the blinding nature of power and the fragility of relationships when there is a power struggle. The German play Dr. Faustus would popularize the deal with the devil trope in Western fiction. Birthed from Enlightenment era Europe, Goethe's tale of the scholar who sells his soul to the devil when earthly knowledge ceases to satisfy him was a commentary on the increasing materialism over spirituality at that time. Or at least that's how the English version goes. It's another story which hits different. I could switch gears and start making go broke, go broke content, but no, no, I must make art and make it challenging and and everything. The point I'm trying to make in connecting these stories is that power, excess, and guilt has been a cornerstone of Western storytelling for a while. And stories, if they're done well, will put you in the position of the characters, in spite of our material differences. Souls connect, and it's a beautiful, wonderful thing, though it can be abused. And I had heard rumors, but I, I couldn't really believe it. Sure, this and all the adjoining down. properties. But this is a legendary theater. Do you have any idea who played here? This is an historical theater. My God. I've heard the argument made, don't ask me by who, that criticizing European art is unfair because they're just expressing themselves like everyone else. I actually agree that everyone should have the right to express themselves as they see fit. You're gonna tear this down? You're telling me you're gonna tear this down? What interests you about it anyway? Look at it! So it's a nice archaic theater, so what? But Western art, through colonialism, has prioritized itself and its own standards over others. Film was a French invention before the United States colonized it. The earliest films were a novelty, gimmicky slices of life where the invention itself was the magic. But soon filmmakers realized the untapped potential the medium had in storytelling. One of the first recognized pieces of narrative cinema was Georges Méliès' sci-fi fantasy, Voyage dans la Lune. This film followed a group of scientist wizards who fly out to the moon because free real estate. While there, they discover the uncivilized native people and immediately start blasting. They are temporarily captured by the savages, but soon enough break free after murdering their leader returning to Earth as heroes for having conquered the moon. They even take a moon man back as a slave to put on display. I joke about it, but A Trip to the Moon is one of the seminal works in birthing film art, so it is worth acknowledging the colonialist propaganda. In spite of that, the silent era was actually not as racist as you might think. Whoever could afford to get their hands on a camera was doing their thing. Every race, gender, nationality, as long as they had money, was experimenting with this technology. Of course, you wouldn't know that now because most of the films made by non-white non-men were seen as not important, so they've mostly been lost to time. Out of this climate came D.W. Griffith, an American who, through the most brilliant appropriation of all the techniques developed by everyone else and backed by the then newly invented Hollywood studio system, made an epic for the ages birth of a nation, a celebration of the confederacy and cautionary tale of the inevitable collapse of American society if black people are given basic human rights. This epic would be seen as an artistic achievement of American cinema, the first film ever to be shown in the White House, and would haunt film students' curriculums to this very day. What a world we live in. I used to get under the table and listen to my father and his friends talk about the battles they'd been through and their struggles. 
Those things impress you deeply. The film celebrates the rise of the KKK, a band who Griffith's own parents were a part of. You know, and you've heard your father tell about fighting day after day, and about your mother staying up night after night sewing robes for the clan. The clan at that time was needed and served a purpose. Yes, I think it's true. And went on to revitalize the clan, which had fallen out of popularity with the turn of the century. Now, there was backlash. People protested. But the society was ultimately racist enough to let the film become a touchstone of American cinema. But it, it, it had the fury of life in it. I mean, it, it made your blood, oh, made your blood tingle. It was about something. You can tell easily a story about something. It was about a tremendous struggle. It's about a story of people that were fighting desperately against great odds. Of course, we look at it now as the most racist film of all time, but I do think there's still a lesson in the fact that Griffith, in the depths of his ignorance, genuinely thought he was cooking. He was blindingly ignorant, but boy was he powerful. Great sacrifices, suffering, death. It was a great struggle, a great story. It's been said that the only propaganda that can work to the point of having visible societal impact is conservative propaganda, not liberal or leftist propaganda. On my channel, I've always said that art has changed me, not true. Pack of lies. It enforces. I mentioned before that I was raised in the 1950s, and I could sit here and say that art changed that, but no, no, life did. When I watched Portrait of a Lady on Fire for the first time, I didn't know what it was, and seeing those two women make love and the whole abortion thing made me feel funny. But now I want to feed the homophobes to sharks, and the notion of there being an abortion debate makes me kind of nauseous. What's happened? The work, my virus. More on this in the Barbie section, but I had to make the conscious choice to expand my knowledge and open myself up to the truly frightening possibility that everything that I think I know might be wrong. Through research, a couple semesters of sociology, and indoctrination by left-wing propagandists on YouTube, my thoughts gradually evolved. The art, however, is what enforced that shift. Conservative propaganda works because conservatism is already the status quo. You don't need to make that deliberate shift because the ideas presented are attitudes that are already the default. It is tradition. It is the norm. It is even what is entertaining. When a work seeks to conserve tradition, it appeals to the basic morality of the society it is made for. For America and other Western societies, tradition is patriarchy, it's colonialism, it is white supremacy. Birth of a nation looks bad now, we all know this, but would it ruffle too many feathers if I was to present to you the argument that all American media is still, at its core, to this very day, white supremacist? Discord makes my dick hard. White supremacy is defined by Oxford as the belief that white people constitute a superior race and should therefore dominate society, typically to the exclusion or detriment of other racial or ethnic groups. A definition by my friend Miriam Webster expands on this, stating that it is the social, economic, and political systems that collectively enable white people to maintain power over people of other races. I choose to define white supremacy as opposed to racism because I want to be very specific in this analysis. Often when people hear the term racist, they turn their ears off, even if they do check all of the boxes. D.W. Griffith didn't think he was a racist, but from the framework of white supremacy, I want you all to evaluate with me some of the media we've been hyping up over the past few years. But not yet, there's still more lore stuff to get into. You're rough and funny, aren't you? I apologize if you just clicked for the stuff in the thumbnail, but for this topic, I really do think it's important to properly establish the context. One of the reasons I made my Orson Welles essay was because one of my courses had us watch Citizen Kane. Already being an Orson Welles fan at this point, I fell in love with the movie even more than the first couple times, but the rest of the class slept. The swine. You wouldn't know the church 
out of the theater and it smacked you in the mouth. Shut up, Orson, or I'll smack you in the mouth. I may have let my facade of being a functional member of society slip, and I fear. A bit of film brewism was unleashed. It became a sort of meme for the rest of the semester how everyone hated Midas and Kane, except for Judah, the film expert. But there was a comment made by one of my peers, which stuck with me. In my Orson Welles video, I did the most, especially in the first half, to articulate what Orson Welles has meant to me. When I see Orson Welles, I see the base communists who kick the ass of theater and radio, proceeding to reinvent cinema at the age of 25, then cancelled by the industry for being too woke, going on to continue making masterpiece after masterpiece, despite having little to no support. Citizen Kane, both in the context of his life and that particular zeitgeist in film history, canonized itself as an absolute landmark achievement. While the themes we'd see in White Guild's art date back to ancient Greece, I'd argue that Citizen Kane is where White Guild cinema, in the true sense of that term, was born. The comments made by my peer was, okay, but why should I care about another story about some old white man who beats his wife? This is now the fourth time I'm talking about Citizen Kane on this channel, so I'll try to keep it short. Get on with it! Get on with it! Citizen Kane is, among other things, a commentary on the trappings of capitalism and how, in spite of a person's ambitions, they will always be poisoned by that system. Charles Foster Kane is sold off by his parents to live with a rich man who would grant him the best education and financing possible. He then becomes a young newspaper tycoon who takes over business after business and slanders and maligns the wealthy. I am the publisher of the Enquirer. It's my duty to see to it that decent, hardworking people aren't robbed blind by a pack of money mad pirates. His empire grows and he even goes into politics. But as his power grows, so does his vanity. Kane is a hero of the working man. Kane is here to make everything better. What is his name? What is his name? I'm Charles Foster Kane! But we are made to question whether his ambitions are as noble as he so passionately claims. I'm no cheap, crooked politician! Trying to save himself! Or if this is all a big ego trip for him. You talk about the people as though you own them. Give in the people their right. As if you can make them a present of liberty. Kane marries his second wife because she's a singer. We're gonna be a great opera star. Are you gonna sing at the Metropolitan, Mrs. Kane? We certainly are. He even builds her an opera house and makes her a big star, even though she never wanted to be an opera singer. Or a big star. My essay makes the argument that Orson Welles, at the age of 25, was prophetically playing a version of himself, except his vice wasn't greed. His great weakness as I perceive it, was his obsession with himself. By making that essay, I tried to peel the layers of the popular Orson Welles narrative, challenging it a bit, even challenging myself, by asking why it is that I look up to him. What you gotta remember is what you're looking at is also you. The subtext being how damn near impossible it is to truly make a story about someone without inadvertently revealing more about yourself. Pretentious. Probably the most honest thing I've ever written about how I view myself, under the guise of a retrospective about someone you else. You propose to have yourself made ridiculous. I'm the one that's gotta do it, Finn! Why don't you let me alone? My reasons satisfy me, Susan! I suppose in the end, that essay really was just made for myself. Haven't we had this conversation before? I write these like episodes, so apologies to new viewers if I'm referring to past videos too much. But if you did see that essay, you know that White Guild cinema wasn't always as hot then as it is now. Part of why Wells is said to have been ahead of his time is because he was guilty before most of his colleagues. Today, it is common practice to make fun of the bourgeoisie religion or any other structures of power, but in the tradition built by the American film industry, it used to be a very taboo. Whereas during the early days of cinema when it was all independent and anyone could cook, Hollywood came around and regulated who could and couldn't be given financial support as well as who could and couldn't have access to an audience. So Hollywood, being a corporate entity as any other, removed support from all the non-white, non-male filmmakers plunging their work into obscurity and ruin. Hollywood being such a superpower even made its influence outside of America, challenging the standards and traditions of other ways of making films. 
There's another video on my channel, something I did for an assignment in school, so I, I don't necessarily count it as a part of the canon. It examines the history of the Hollywood studio system and what you'll realize if you're able to stomach the amateurish editing and line delivery is that I truly struggle to see the rise of the Hollywood system as anything besides one group of powerful, wealthy people expanding their influence through the exclusion of people who are inconvenient for them. Whether that be all the actors from the silent era whose voices were deemed unfit for sound, all the filmmakers of color, or even someone like Mr. Wells whose films consistently flopped despite being seen by critics as high art. My daughter has a, has a group of books about Hollywood that she bought, I don't know why, and uh, I took to reading them lately, and I realized how many great people that town has destroyed since its earliest beginnings. Almost everybody of merit was destroyed or diminished. They preferred the similar looking, financially convenient, safe films which consistently proved to appeal to the biases of their audience. But people aren't stupid. Eventually, the Hollywood studio model ran dry, too many formulaic rom-coms, westerns, and musicals. After World War II, we started to see non-American films take on entirely different approaches. A surge of movements arose out of these socio-political shifts that they were experiencing. And the American filmmakers coming of age were watching. Where in American westerns, the hero was a clean-shaven symbol of moral and ethnic superiority to the Indians and the outlaws, the Italian westerns show a scruffier, uglier cowboy with no heroes to be seen at all. While the good guys always win at the end of American films, the French preferred to kill off their protagonists who were often devoid of such moral superiority. Even the British started to openly poke fun of religion. Their rise of independent cinema was an extension of the counterculture of the 1960s. People rioted, people were killed, a bunch of countries gained their independence, it was a wild and wacky time. What we saw in these artists was the first time mainstream film as a dominant power started to reflect upon itself. And soon enough, the Americans couldn't evade this inevitability any longer. Massive budget Hollywood films started to flop as the masses were in droves taking a preference to alternative mediums like television and comics, as well as the smaller budget independent cinema. Regular Joe Schmoes were pulling up to watch Ingmar Bergman and Jacques Demy. It was crazy. I've always considered this to be the true golden age of cinema because people whose stories were never told before were now given a voice. The values of the establishment were now openly being questioned. But what I've started to gain a better appreciation for as of late is as new as these films looked and felt, they were still predominantly being made by and for the same group of people. I believe in America. America has made my fortune, and I raised my daughter in the American fashion. The Godfather is maybe the greatest embodiment of this change in American cinema. A film series that takes us into the lives of repugnant, corrupt people, where all morality is grey at best, and American values are challenged directly. My father assured him that either his brains or his signature would be on a contract. That's my family, kid. It's not me. Michael Corleone's initial insistence that he was different from his mobster family is quickly challenged when his father needs him. Michael tries to live his own life, serving for the war, doing his studies, courting a woman, living the clean life, but somehow he cannot escape his heritage. Vito Corleone has built himself up, an immigrant from Sicily, starting his crew from the ground up, out of necessity, and frankly, he had no options either. <laughs> But now Michael, removed from this context, is forced to live with the consequences, arguably in a twisted way, making him have less of a soul than his father, only inheriting his worst traits. Once told me, in five years the Corleone family will be completely legitimate. That was seven years ago. Michael can tell himself that he's better all he wants, that he will make the family legitimate, but operating within a world of corruption, he never stood a chance. If you had the Academy Awards night to do over again, would you do any of that differently? Well... The winner is Marlon Brando in The Godfather. Hello, 
My name is Sasheen Littlefeather. I'm Apache, and I am president of the National Native American Affirmative Image Committee. I'm representing Marlon Brando this evening, and he has asked me to tell you that he very regretfully cannot accept this very generous award. And the reasons for this being are the treatment of American Indians today by the film industry, excuse me, Since the American Indian hasn't been able to have his voice heard, I felt that it was a marvelous opportunity for an Indian to be able to voice his opinion. I beg at this time that I have not intruded upon this evening and that we will, in the future, our hearts and our understandings will meet with love and generosity. I was embarrassed for Shashin. She wasn't able to say what she intended to say. As a rule, and maybe I don't say this enough, I don't talk about media I don't like, even when I'm critiquing them, because I want to stress that it is not a crime and you should not feel like a bad person for liking art that is harmful. These ideas are everywhere, and everyone can resonate with any work of art for any reason. This is how art works, this is how stories work. But they must still be held accountable. Having said all that, this rambling has been me preparing my butt because we have finally reached a point where I call all your favorite shows and movies of the past few years racist. After making the greatest British sitcom of all time, Jesse Armstrong topped the golden age of American television, given a big bag of money by HBO to make a drama about sad rich people yelling at each other in offices. Do you want to hit me? Succession follows a family which runs a global media and entertainment conglomerate as they try to figure out who will take over the current aging leader, Logan Roy. We watch his children, Kendall, Siobhan, Roman, and occasionally Connor, who make complete and other asses of themselves in this struggle for power. I'm the youngest boy! Succession is white guilt cinema at its absolute peak. Just the name Succession is perfectly fitting because this show quite directly follows the legacy of all of these stories we've been talking about so far. From the sad kings like Solomon to the perfectly written Greek tragedy of it all to the absolute Faustian dealings that each of its characters will do to get ahead to the fact that the media tycoon Logan Roy is basically a Republican Charles Foster Kane, to the fact that this whole story could be seen as a soft reboot of The Godfather. Cinema. <laughs> Indeed, Succession could be seen as a story about the agony of wealth. Did you come here to see me at all? Well, look, we haven't been getting along that great lately. Gojo is my idea. <laughs> you stole my idea. What are you, six? We focus on these big babies, the Roy children, who grapple with the position they've been put in by their wealthy father. Could be me. I love you, man, but you're not a serious person. Following in his footsteps, so they will never quite be him. I love you, but you are not serious people. Like Vito Corleone, Logan is an immigrant who worked to get where he is. You're a bunch of stuck up cunts who can't fucking bear to see me win. Not a real person. Have a good birthday, okay? Face but his kids never had to think about money. They're damaged in their own unique way. All their relationships are fragile and transactional. It means you hated him. I didn't hate him. You also sort of killed him. They've never truly learned empathy. Who knows how many people live in Indonesia? Like, who actually gives a shit? Fuck Indonesia. And frankly, none of them really knows what to do with their lives outside of the business. You like the power. You couldn't get a job in a burger joint, let alone a Fortune 500 without some nepotism, and do like the glamour No, I could just do with the assistance of the family firm on my ambitions to become president. And it is painful to watch, but it's also kind of entertaining. On your show, you have items that were entertaining, or uh, they offer some sort of sparkling interlude for what otherwise might be a sea of dullness. You ask them some question like that. The question of whether or not I throw manure out of a uh, fourth story window of a house on 50 oh, seconds. Yeah. You have to think about your ratings. And people would rather listen to that than yesterday the Supreme Court refused to hear the uh, uh, Pyramid Lake water right issue. People don't want to hear that. They want to hear me describe how I might have put the... <laughs>
I can only tell you that I was on 52nd Street the other day and they haven't cleaned it up yet. Ken's son has been adopted by the internet as a sort of baby girl because this poor little rich boy- I'm afraid I have to inform you, you are all dismissed. Yeah, you're, you're all fired. <laughs> Is that all you got? Throughout the course of the show, he goes from daddy's boy ripe for the throne to enemy of the state to daddy's slave to woke subversive hero of the people to punk rich kid to daddy's boy again and so on and so forth. Why? Because my dad told me to. This man has been damaged by his upbringing and he has absolutely no idea what he's doing. It is genuinely heartbreaking. His siblings and the rest of the cast are the same. They are all sad, pathetic, terrible people. But the show illustrates that at every step. The world made them this way. The system did. Okay, well, I didn't know. Sure, whatever, but yeah, you did. A pipeline of sad dancers who got used and abused and promised some Hollywood bullshit we fucking knew. Right, no, I, I mean, I kind of knew. But boy, it sure is a spectacle, isn't it? We're taken into their luxurious penthouses, occasionally castles, to indulge in the cultures and debaucheries of the bourgeois. Do you know what they're doing up in the suite? They're picking the next president. And it's empty. Yes. It is painful. Yes. But it's still... We never do see the effects of what these people are doing. Sure, we get a glimpse, a sense, somewhat. There will be people protesting on the street outside of their building. We hear how people are talking about them on social media. There's an entire plotline where they are deliberating whether or not to allow a capital of fascists to become the president of the United States. Come on! Oh, well, will no one think of the children? There comes a time where you oh. have to oh, to, 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 to. And I don't mean Genocide Joe type fascist. I mean out and proud, probably attends clan rallies type fascist. But he's good for their business. So under Wisconsin law, the vote can't be certified. Macon says we're done. Wisconsin's done. 100,000 absentee Milwaukee ballots missing. We, we can count the votes that we have. However, unfortunately, none of that really matters to the Roys as long as they get their bread. Ken San feels a pang of guilt when he hears that his non-white daughter, who we rarely see, is experiencing some racism. Pushed my daughter. Uh, she's okay. People are gonna say shit. Yeah, we'll be in the West Wing. Nothing matters, Ken. But ultimately, it's just business. They might like a story like that. It's not personal, Sonny. It's strictly business. A whole rocket ship may explode under one of our beloved characters' supervision, and yes, it's bad. We know they're bad, but we still love them. In fact, we are them. When Ken cries, I cry! When Shiv betrays Tom, or Tom betrays her back, we're meant to feel that. Because this is a story. The characters are stuck in a hell of the soul, trapped by their power. Their actions objectively have more disastrous effects on everyone else, yet they are still at the center of the conversation. Jor, Roman hates himself and has suffered irreparable emotional damage because of his childhood abuse and emotional neglect. But you know, well, but it also sucked for the Japanese people on that rocket he destroyed. Christopher Nolan has always been a hit or miss director for me. His stuff always either bores me to tears or makes me levitate. I didn't care when I first heard that he was making a film about the guy who built the atomic bomb. I was kind of annoyed, actually. However, on that fateful Barbenheimer week, I was shocked and horrified to learn that we'd be getting Barbie a week after the rest of the world, yet Oppenheimer was set to release right on schedule. I was planning my whole week around that cinema trip, so I said, might as well. Oppenheimer shot me into the heavens. I truly have never in my life left a theater feeling the way that I did when I finished Oppie. I was so deeply moved, but also slightly disturbed at the feeling. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Don't get me wrong, it was exactly what I was expecting. A long-form character study of a powerful white man who feels bad because of the consequences of his actions. He knowingly creates a bomb which will devastate millions and quite possibly create a means for humanity to end itself. Then he feels bad! It was in the minutes following when I immediately started scrambling to concoct a letterbox review to articulate my feelings that I realized what disturbed me. You think that if you let them tar and feather you? The world would forgive you. Like Succession, Oppenheimer's crimes are in what is not shown. There are no Japanese people shown at all. There was little acknowledgement to the absolute damage done to the indigenous land that Oppenheimer used to test his bomb and the effects that that had on them. But this is all quite deliberate. 
The film is called Oppenheimer. Not the Manhattan Project, not World War II for Dummies, not Godzilla. This is about the man, J. Robert Oppenheimer, and his personal ambitions and subsequent agony over having created the bomb. This is what was such an infuriating thing to so many people. But is it bad art? I joked in my Living and Dying for Art essay that Christopher Nolan stole from anime twice. Three times if you count the to say yes to that film that inspired Paprika. But Oppenheimer and Hayao Miyazaki's The Wind Rises are genuinely the same movie, albeit on opposite sides of the tracks. Both of them are biopics following science nerds who are swept up by their government's shenanigans in World War II to create weapons of mass destruction for them. The only real difference being the scale of Oppies. Wind was supposed to be Miyazaki's swan song before he caught a fondness for herons, and it is seen as a reflection of Miyazaki's own relationship with his art. I remember this place. This is where we first met in our kingdom of dreams. Now it's the land of the dead. Both his obsessive nature, isolating him from his loved ones, and the anxiety he feels over having his work disseminated by an industry which increasingly frustrates him. You cracked the case. Dr. Junkers is in trouble. In trouble? He fights the hand that feeds him, and he will lose. Nolan's Oppenheimer has been interpreted as him, expressing his own anxiety over being an artist working within a corrupt industry. Now it's your turn to deal with the consequences of your achievement. The bomb in this case being having started the oversaturation of superhero movies with his Dark Knight trilogy. Oppenheimer wanted to own the atomic bomb. He wanted to be the man who moved the earth. If he could do it all over, he'd do it all the same. Oppenheimer and The Wind Rises aren't about the effects of these guys' actions, nor are they about how terrible they are. They are stories about boys with dreams who are exploited by industries and systems which take advantage of them and amplify their more toxic traits, which is a theme that I relate to heavy. Film bro is a term that emerged sometime circa the mid-2010s to refer to a certain kind of cinephile who watches a certain kind of film. They are usually semi-complicated American, usually contemporary stuff made by white men for white men about the white male experience. You know, stuff from Scorsese, Tarantino, Paul Thomas Anderson, David Fincher, Kubrick, Nolan, Hitchcock, Wells. What defines a film bro and why you'll often see them getting clowned is for their hesitation to reach outside of that bubble, often looking down upon other types of films. Yet they'll turn around and claim to be film experts. Of course, these films aren't bad, in fact, they usually are really good, but you know, there's just so much out there to be explored, so many different kinds of films made by so many different kinds of people for so many different reasons. Yet this, this cult, will only ever feel comfortable within their little bubble. The film bro is, however, not to be confused with the newcomer to film fandom or the film casual who just watches what they enjoy and happens to be exposed to these things. There is a snobbishness to the film bro in their pride, in their expertise. The film bro will preach to you about the cultural necessity of the cinematic experience, but will not be able to tell you the names of more than three women directors. Their favorite non-English language director is either Bong Joon-ho, or if they're really cultured, Jean-Luc Godard. They gave Barbie a half-star in Letterboxd, but not for the reasons I'll get into, because they gave Oppenheimer the full five. Why did I bring all this up? Because Oppenheimer, and quite frankly, the crowd it attracts, reminds me of all the things I hate about film broism. I've, I've had my film bro tendencies. I still have my film bro tendencies. You wouldn't know the church out of the theater if it smacked you in the mouth. Though I don't think I've necessarily been full film bro. The perpetuation of films like Oppenheimer being and remaining the beacon of the cinematic form reminds me of perhaps everything wrong with the culture of cinema. Also, just for the record, I'm aware that TikTokers have recently reappropriated the term film bro to have the exact opposite meaning. Maybe more of that later, perhaps. As a film, as a piece of western fiction, Oppenheimer is damn beautiful. Christopher Nolan got droves of people from all walks of life to sit down in a the theater and connect emotionally to a man who massacred thousands, plunged the world into a new level of warfare, 
and created a means for us to end ourselves in an instant. By centering Bob Oppie, the audience connects on a human level to their fellow man and is even challenged to reflect upon themselves and evaluate what they might have in common with them. The important thing isn't can you read music, it's can you hear it, can you hear the music, Robert. The thing about humanizing people like Oppenheimer is that, well, they are human. Nothing above, nothing below. We could all be like him in certain circumstances. I saw myself in him, as someone with passions who is also prone to obsession, egomania, and perhaps a lack of foresight, but it's just, you know... I didn't blub the damn Japanese! <laughs> and quite frankly, most of the people watching will never have that kind of power either. The power of cinema to put people in that place is not something to take lightly, so the question arises, why does Chris Nolan use this powerful tool to make us all become death? rather than empathize with the deceased. Japanese cinema has been exploring the bomb and its effects quite literally since they dropped. But these films are always, you know, for the Japanese people. The entries of that canon which have crossed the borders must either do so through metaphor and genre or through the avant-garde. And the truth of it is, Christopher Nolan can't tell that story. Genius is no guarantee of wisdom. Look at this man who saw so much be so blind. He's a powerful white man. Oppenheimer is a story about the experience of a powerful white man, made for the white man. But the white man's art is the world's. Fuck Indonesia. Many people will say that Oppenheimer is a bad film for these reasons, but I disagree. I think it merely highlights the badness of film culture. English is an English word. Cinema was born in French. This is their turf. When white art is made, it is given the platform, scale, and respect of the world. When they speak, we all listen. It's never any use, is it, apologizing? It's even worse when you haven't done anything wrong and they still feel guilty. White man has never had to look one of his victims in the eye. But maybe sometimes it is even more nefarious when he does. Can you find the wolves in this picture? Martin Scorsese, as mentioned in the intro, has been one of the champions of terrible white man cinema, except his studies are always infused with Catholic guilt. The disparity of trying to reach divinity and holiness in a corrupt, seductively sinful world has been present in his work from the late 60s, and he's made a legendary career in American cinema, exploring his own guilt and temptations through his art. I've been following the CEO of cinema's latest crime epic since I first heard DiCaprio mention it like 4 or 5 years ago. His first western, which would star both of his boys, Bobby De Niro and Leo DiCaprio, as the embodiment of colonial greed, here to commit a massacre against a small but rich Native American tribe, based on a true but mostly forgotten story. As a non-US but technically American citizen, the struggle of that group has had a strange place in my consciousness. The native people in my country were mostly eradicated by Columbus, though not entirely annihilated like I was taught in school. So the nuance of the experience of those of the US has been a massive blind spot. But this film was my first real experience being properly sat down and told a bit of their story. Albeit, of course, told from the perspective of the white man. Guilty. How come you don't have a husband? You got nice color skin. What, what color would you say that is? My color. Killers of the Flower Moon is about Ernest Burkhart and his uncle William Hale as they carry out a murder of the Osage Nation by befriending and even sharing love with them, only to kill them and take their wealth. You give her a shot? Yeah, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Giving her all of it? Yeah. The emotional weight of the story lies in Ernest's relationship with his Osage wife, Molly, and the question of whether he truly loves her or not. Because he's, he's killing her. He married her as a deal with his uncle to kill her and her family, but he genuinely seems to love her. Storm, it's uh, powerful. So we need to be quiet for a while. Molly holds the heart of the entire story with her minimalist but powerful presence. And sorry if I'm jumping ahead here. Lily Gladstone's performance, in my opinion, outshines the two legendary white male actors who are getting way more screen time than her, and she's literally just sitting and staring half the time. If you think Margot got snubbed, 
later. Discord makes my But this is the conflict of both the story and the film itself. This is a story about something very personal to the Osage. Even the book was taken from their perspective, though. I mean, I mean it was also early FBI white savior propaganda, which is its own problem. But Scorsese, like Nolan, quite deliberately takes it from the perspective of the aggressors. You're next. The actual Osage people almost serve as pawns in their morality tale. The film from the start makes the audience feel like the white man. They are on ground that is not theirs. Half the time, the natives are speaking words they can't even understand. Molly always has that knowing look in her eye. She has Ernest all figured out, but she still chooses to be with him. Why? There is just this heavy air of ignorance and guilt which hangs over the whole story, both in the main characters and even in the filmmaker himself. I can't speak too much to the, the Osage representation as neither a white person nor an indigenous person, so I'll link some reviews from indigenous perspectives below. Now the production design was really good. They, they really were able to mix the historiosity with the authenticity of like the Osage people, how they dressed, how they talked, uh, portraying some of the ceremonies. The one scene that really like, kind of, it was the first like tear jerking scene and it, it probably wasn't like this for non-native audiences, but it hit me. It was another like ancestor type scene, very much like in Reservation Dogs season two, but it was with Lizzie Q who Tonto Cardinal plays Molly's mother. She's dying and as she's dying, she opens her eyes and the first thing she sees is some of her ancestors. That scene was just touching. Like it was, it was something that I personally would like to see, you know, more of, of, of that. Because what happened to the Osage people, their history, the setup of how it all came to a head, uh, you know, why, why this, this all was able to happen, um, should have been explained because that is a good chunk of interesting story right there. I studied Native American history. I always like, oh gosh, you know, that, that it can't get any more tragic than, you know, this, what I've read from history until I read what happened to the Osage people. And my God, I thought I knew the links and how much bureaucracy was set up against the Osage people. The time in which this was set culturally is nothing close to what it is today, you know? And so you really have to explain the mindset of the Osage people at this time, why they came into um, such a situation in which they were so prone to being victimized. We don't get that sense of paranoia, paranoia throughout the community. I wish we had saw that a little bit more. The same goes for uh, Tatanka Means character who he infiltrates, you know, the, the, the tribe in a way to really get their perspectives. Like, cause he's an FBI, undercover FBI agent. He's pulling another uh, Jim Chi and Thunderheart here. He He's infiltrating to be able to kind of get an idea and get close to the community but this is kind of the more i read about it the more i've been seeing people's reactions and the ending is really telling me why scorsese and eli roth chose this new direction much of the commentary which is all very divisive let's be clear is that while it is great that awareness of these events is being raised especially at the scale that this film does the CEO of cinema and everything. The fact that it, from the start, takes the perspective of the white people is more than a bit annoying, calling into question what the true intentions of the film were. That this, this film wasn't made for the Osage. As an Osage, I really wanted this to be from the perspective of Molly. I think in the end, the question that you can be left with is how long will you be complacent with racism? How long will you go along with something and not say something, not speak up. Even the Osage people who worked on the film question why someone who truly loved his wife would do what Ernest did. But when somebody conspires to murder your entire family, 
Uh, that's not love. Though in the end, who, inside of their own nation, would even care to listen had they not been told the story through this, this case? This film was not made for an Osage audience. It was made for everybody not Osage. Uh, for those that have been disenfranchised, they can relate. But for other countries, you know, that have their acts and their histories of oppression, um, this is an opportunity for them to ask themselves this question of morality. This is a conflict that seems to have perplexed even Scorsese. <laughs> the film ends in one of the most unique experimental meta ways possible. The story is cut off and they do a sort of comedy skit where they parody a radio show. William Hale was found guilty and sent to Leavenworth for life. Which sensationalizes the whole thing, explaining where the characters, or people, end up after everything is said and done. This man, he is being released. Nobody cares about the Osage lies. It even ends with Ibro Sensei himself coming to directly address the audience. Mrs. Molly Cobb, 50 years of age, passed away at 11 o'clock Wednesday night at her home. This is perhaps a meta-commentary about Scorsese's own guilt over expressing this story which he, as a white man, can only have so much perspective on through the only language he knows how, entertainment, and perhaps even a commentary about his whole career. To me, a non-Osage person, whatever that perspective is worth, the film does not appear to truly be about the massacres at all. This is not about the Osage people, this was never truly their story. Does it serve as a history lesson on those events to educate ignorant swine like me? Sure, but as art, particularly because of that ending. I read the film as being a meta-commentary about the inherent racism of the film industry and American entertainment as a whole. He could have had an Osage person co-write the script if he wanted. There were enough working both in front of and behind the camera, so it's clear that if he truly from the start wanted this to be their story, that was possible. To me, it looks like he always wanted to tell a white story about the inherent whiteness of Hollywood and the limitations of auteurs like him who are well-intentioned, working within the confines of white supremacist industries. Just bites that even with that most generous of interpretations, the film ends up being white supremacist. <laughs> No, I'm glad you did. Men's incorruptible, and that's what I hope. How long since you tried a new shade of eyeshadow? There are 25 beautiful colors. Super Rich Shadow by Revlon. Oh, I'm good. In my last video, I expressed the guilt, probably caused by overthinking, about how I chose to end my Barbie video, but I don't know if I explained exactly why. I approached the video quite deliberately as an outsider, Barbie being as far away from my usual taste as possible. And while I did do the research and become a sort of Barbie scholar for that video, I still lack that lived experience of having grown up with the franchise. The actual topic of the video is about trying to be subversive while working within mediums that undermine your message. And like I said before, I still agree with the overall message, but when the film came out and the actual woman who had a past with Barbie started voicing differing opinions about both the movie and the franchise as a whole, what happened in me is that I was reminded of the limitations of my perspective. Not that that means that the video is bad at all, people liked it, mostly women. I suppose what happened is that I got a swift and necessary reminder that I was but a guest in the dream house, and perhaps my opinions may not be the most urgent. Either you're brainwashed or you're weird and ugly, there is no in-between. Sing it, sister. Barbie is a unique one because no matter what I say about the movie, I'll get one clan sharpening their pitchforks or another. Discord makes So let me start with the joys of Barbie. Barbie was and is truly a miracle. I have never in my entire life had a theatrical experience like this. Truly feels like something of another time while also something being strikingly original. The fact that this thing even got made is a miracle. There is no IP movie like this in its sincere metamodernist reflection of its own existence. This is the first massive budget IP blockbuster explicitly made for women. I have been following Barb's production since I first saw Letterboxd post an image of me as Ken-san to their Instagram a year before it came out. I watched the entire Barbie franchise as homework 
I made a video essay about it, which I've already spoken about. I saw the damn thing twice in theaters within the same week. This is something I literally never do. Again, I cannot stress how much of a miracle it is that this thing even got approved, and I sincerely feel grateful to have been able to see it in its intended format. Look at your upper thigh. What is that? It's not cellular. And then you're gonna start getting sad and mushy and complicated. No! Barbie's conflict was about struggling to live up to perceived images of perfection and learning to embrace yourself. The Barbie franchise has always screamed the message, you can be anything, and this movie has the same. Though with a lucidity to the fact that Barbie, as she has always existed in culture, is fundamentally flawed for carrying an image of femininity which presents itself as being perfect. I also have a unique take on the ending, which I will get into later, but oh, cancer! Kendall Toy. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Is considered by most, including myself, to low key be the MVP here. Oh, but I don't want you here. This is my dream house. It's Barbie's dream house. <laughs> Ken and Barbie visit the real world and discover that the patriarchy actually has not been vanquished by the Barbie dolls. And Ken decides to take this Bay Sigma grinds at Giga Chad philosophy into the Barbie world, where he and his fellow men are disenfranchised. We failed them! No, you failed me! Ryan Gosling's hilarious performance steals the show. One lady? She even asked me for the time. <laughs> that character's arc hit because it reminded me of what seems to have hit a lot of young guys heavy in the past few years. And damn near happened to me in a past life. <laughs> like I mentioned earlier, I was raised violently conservative. But I've never been much of a fan of toxic masculinity. I've always been a beanie wearing, Mac DeMarco listening soy boy. I've never cared for the sports ball or anything like that. But there was always a part of me that felt like this was a weakness. I was raised in the tradition of gentlemanliness and chivalry, which is still patriarchy, but nice patriarchy. Then COVID hit. I took a gap here and discovered the world, but rather early on, I was introduced to what in a couple years become known as the Manosphere. <laughs> I started listening to that one silly man who insists that men clean their rooms because he said some nifty things about art and used big words which rhetorically fit the Christo-fascist ideology I was raised on. Do you believe in God? And I think, okay, there's a couple of mysteries in that question. What do you mean, do? What do you mean, you? But a part of what made me take the genuine effort to step back was when the concept of woman returning to the kitchen started making sense. The gripes I've always had with having to perform masculinity were always somehow being projected onto the advent of the liberated woman. But even at the dreadful age of 17, I got the feeling that that could not be completely right. So then I went the extreme other way and started doing the research and soon enough I realized all the things that I hated about the unfairness of the world towards men was actually patriarchy. Not women having more rights but men's insistence on in clinging to inhumane standards. That paired with capitalism, which explained everything I hated about Disney, which demands that men isolate and grind themselves into dust to prove their worth as a man. Who are you texting? No one. Hmm. Let me just... <laughs> Ken San's arc of discovering the Barbie Universe's version of patriarchy only to learn how it just serves to isolate and dehumanize it different. You can tell them that you've never seen The Godfather and that you'd love them to explain it to you. Wait, is this play about us? The Kens, due to their obsession with proving their power, turning on each other and having a big Ken off, only to have the Barbies reclaim their town by organizing behind their backs was the most hilarious commentary about toxic masculinity that I've seen. The whole sequence was also just such a spectacle to see in a large theater, my god. I just wish the audience said that message would have probably been best suited for it wasn't, ironically, the most sensitive set of snowflakes too fragile in their masculinity to see that perhaps the most damning criticism that can be made against the Barbie movie is that the most memorable character arc in the film is that of the man. The week of the 2023 Oscar nominations would be what finally made me take a step back and start listening to all the criticisms. I'd already made peace with the fact that the Barbie movie was always only gonna do so much. Because it's a Hollywood movie, it's one backed by a massive corporation at that, it was always gonna ultimately have the end of serving as an ad. 
These Mojo Dojo Casa houses are literally flying off the shelf. The money is pouring in. You think I spent my entire life in boardrooms because of a bottom line? Sure, no real subversive message went through. The feminism portrait in the film is very two-dimensional, girls rule, boys jewel type feminism for babies. I'm picking up on some sort of entendre, and I would just like to inform you, I do not have a vagina. That's okay. I have all, all the genitals. There is no real change in the Barbie land. The little jokes against Mattel were always tongue in cheek. Could I just meet the woman in charge? Oh, that would be me. And the corporation is portrayed as being lovable goofballs. We knew this would happen. Sure, Mattel sweeps the actual criticisms under the rug by making sure to have stereotypical Barbie be just the one woman. Meanwhile, all the others are diverse in race, body type, and ability, which erases how homogenous stereotypical Barbie really is and has been. Also, much of the valid criticisms which have been lobbied against Barbie for years are delivered through a teenage girl. You know, the demographic taken the least seriously in Western culture. But we, 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 we expected this. When all the video essays and think pieces by leftists started coming out, my copium was always, you guys didn't really think the doll movie was gonna have Barbie come into the real world, storm the government, start quoting bell hooks, did you? The right wingers got mad because they hate women, I'm not wasting time thinking about them. But on the day of the Oscar nominations, the barbarians betrayed me. I feel like all of us who just enjoyed the Barbie movie as a delightful time in the cinema had a collective bra moment on that day. Brian Gosling got nominated for Best Supporting Actor, probably for all the reasons I mentioned before. But apparently Margot's lack of nomination for Best Actress was the fault of the patriarch in spite of all the other women actors nominated being, for one, woman, but also one being non-American and the other being the first Native American woman ever to be nominated for said category, which is a big deal for a lot of reasons. Steve McQueen. Clint Eastwood, yes, of course. I, I very seldom make mistakes. He uh, did his version of a joke, and then John Wayne looked like he was about ready to get a posse together. The patriarchy apparently got Greta too, which I can honestly see to a certain extent. I do think the Barbie movie was quite an achievement in filmmaking. Four of the five nominees are dudes, but again, the woman who's there isn't American. Barbie was nominated for like eight other things, including Best Picture and Best Adapted Screenplay, which does make Margot, who was a producer, and Greta, who co-wrote the script, um, nominated. The booing made me sore. They thought, well, you're ruining our fantasy with the intrusion of a little reality, and... Even more concerningly, though, the narrative that Barbie got snubbed didn't even acknowledge the fact that America Ferreira, a Latin American woman, got nominated for Best Supporting Actress. It's only when their wealthy white woman didn't get the awards, that they cried, patriarchy. I'm afraid she'll make a... What are you afraid of? I'm afraid to eat in my house. What the whole Barbie debacle forced me to recognize was that while I like the film for legitimate reasons, there are still perspectives which I lack. It doesn't mean that the film is ultimately bad, but there is just some perspective that is necessary that was lacking. I liked Ken San's character arc, but isn't what makes the movie such a special and important film in the first place the fact that it's the first massive budget IP movie for women, but women's issues and the female experience, which isn't attached to some male-centric cinematic multiverse. I then yanked my big ugly patriarchy head out of the sand and started to really consider and seek out more of these criticisms from the actual woman, those whose opinions did not align with mine. Personally, I don't know anyone in real life, male, female, or otherwise, who did not like the movie. But that's just my circle. Their mother and sister enjoyed the movie, but you know, they also believe abortion is murder. I sought out the opinions of those who actually felt left down by a movie which was supposed to be for them, but ultimately served the ends of a corporation, failed to properly address the problems they've had with the dolls for years in favor of a nobody's perfect message, where ultimately the most memorable character was, once again, the man. The son of a bitch is guilty! But what about Fernando? I mean, we we promised oh him a job, God, right? I'm not thinking about that right now. But his mom. His mom? Oh, you're so sweet. Oh. You care about people so much. You're such an angel. Good. You put good, Mr. There'll be consequences. Oh. 
Upcoming Force of Anxiety Cinema Benny Sapti and your autistic friend's favorite avant-garde comedian Nathan Fielder joined forces to create and star in a miniseries which simulates the feeling you get at 3am when you reflect on everything that you said from the age of 10 and start to wonder if everyone secretly hates you. <laughs> The curse, more than anything else discussed so far, specifically deals with the guilt and inherent contradictions of the privileged white liberal American experience. We're very committed to this community. I happen to know Barrier Coffee is a paid sponsor of your show, and it has only signed a six-month lease, so it's not really saying commitment to the community. To Why are you doing this? We're not the enemy. No one is committed to this community. Have you seen this place? Have you driven around? This essay was supposed to come out late last year, but this and the Barbie discourse were godsend. Do you know a man with um, two young girls is staying here? Father, I think, 40-ish, two young girls. Black, I think. The Safdie brothers are great, but Nathan has been my goat since his comedy reality show, Nathan For You. Did you first know that you like to snoop? No, it's not really snooping. I mean, it's well, just, it it's, it's not, you know what I mean? It's, it's observing. Snooping. We call it it's observing. Snooping. Which slipped more and more from cringe comedy. Do you think I really care about Yelp? I don't give a about Yelp. The plan? Give Wolf's Investigations their first five-star Yelp review. It's a sociological experiment art as it went along. You lied to every last one of them. It's business, right? Only to be taught by the modern masterpiece of deconstructionist reality television that was the rehearsal. What on earth was I doing? So when I heard that he and Ben were teaming up with A24 to do a drama with Emma freaking Stone, I, I was sold. And good lord. Make sure it's okay, good. Hi. I, I, I have, I have no, 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 no. It's okay, you. honey. It's okay. I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm not gonna hurt you. No. Hi. Both Nathan and Ben's work have always dealt with anxiety, performance, and the fragility of reality in the context of media. I love you, Daddy. And here, they examine the phenomenon of white guilt as we follow a newlywed couple, Asher and Whitney, as they try to start a reality show based on their project to start eco-friendly housing in their community. This community is filled with various groups of non-white people, Native Americans, Latin Americans, African Americans, and these two own their property. Just want to go back to your family, Whitney. Do you think that- Why are we going back to her family? She answered that. Whitney is the daughter of notorious landlords who are known for their exploitative practices, and she goes out of her way to attempt to be everything that they are not. What is going on with you? The reason that I came back from California was you said these properties could be mine. Mine. You treat me like a child, and I'm a grown-up. I'm a grown-up woman. I'm the youngest boy! Despite the fact that she only has her job because they gave her the property, and she's always running back to them for money. Asher is her husband, and he's Jewish, which I only mention because the show isn't shy to remind us how fragile the white status of Jewish people has been. I was ready to take a bullet for you. Whitney is the embodiment of the hyper-conscious white liberal. That she was. It was devastating. Lizzie, Lizzie, maybe okay. we dial it back with body shaming, huh? What is that? Who at least tells herself that she uses her place of privilege to help others. I, I notice you're touching your neck a lot. Do you have pain? Yeah, it's just. Do you do you take any supplements? Even when they are clearly uncomfortable, or even express. Apprehension. Just relax. Well, it hurts. You gotta relax. You gotta trust me. I think. I think you should stop. I th Here, I just re lean I back. Lean back against me, and then. I think you should. Stop. Just gotta relax All a right. little bit more. Yeah. Oh! The audience is made to question whether she is truly doing these things out of the goodness of her heart, or just for the show. Asher is the same, except it is clear that he just wants to please his wife, who he perhaps feels that he does not deserve. The events of the show take off because of his paranoia over having been cursed by a little black girl who he pretended to give money to for the show. Here's a little something. Thank you. I got a hundred dollars! Oh, we were just shooting a- I curse you. The central flaw of white guilt cinema, I'd argue, is that it centers the people who've always been at the center. Even if they are openly acknowledging their faults,
they still make themselves the center of the conversation. Have you seen Kara's work before? We own four of her pieces. Whitney and Asher allegedly want to do good and platform these indigenous people, acknowledging the failures of their parents and make things right. We gratefully acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather. When the owl does his last hoo-hoo, and the cow does his last moo-moo. Do not do that voice when she's here. I give thanks for this burrito that I'm about to consume. You fought the good fight to be where you are today. I hope. But in the end, their personal hang-ups become the focus. Dougie, the director of the reality show and Asher's alleged friend. Do you know if she's uh, seeing anyone else right now? Or does the idea of her seeing someone else excite you at all? Or Wants to add drama to the show, shifting the focus to Whitney and Asher's clearly troubled relationship. Uh, what was that? You, you looked down and then you rolled your eyes at him. Why? We, he, he had his fucking cell phone in his hand. I just feel like you can't put that thing down while you're giving someone a gift. The show's title changes from flip 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 philanthropy, focusing on the work that they're doing, to Green Queen, centering well. It's moments like this that make me question if Asher, this, this man that I married, truly understands me. And the thing that sucks is that he's right. The show goes from a stale, practice piece of liberal performance to an entertaining drama about these two troubled people. There's so much more to me than people even know. I'm gonna light like fire. And in true meta Nathan Fielder fashion, the same could be said for the actual show. I'd say the we exact same thing if they were white. And I take offense to the fact that you're not validating my feelings. Which does mean for those tracking count, yes, the curse is by the convenient definition I've chosen guilty of being white supremacist, white guilt propaganda. But what makes it interesting and why I was even on the fence to including it in this section as opposed to the next one is that ending. If you put an idea in your head, it can become very real. When I call these stories white supremacists, of course, this is not to say that it celebrates those in power. Again, most of these stories are pretty on point with their criticisms within the text. But it is the form. These stories are white supremacists in form. What does that mean? What does that mean? I remember in my first year, probably one of my first days in university, I was sitting down by myself drawing. Nothing. Change. When I overheard a group of foreign exchange students talking about their impressions of Jamaica and Jamaicans, it was an odd feeling. And I didn't initially mean to eavesdrop, but they were so loud, as though the people they were talking about weren't sitting around them, or maybe they just didn't care. I don't remember exactly what it was that they were saying, but I remember how I felt. It was something about Jamaicans and how they see themselves in the context of colonialism. And I don't think they were even necessarily far off, but it was just... odd. But it was stunning just how confidently these complete outsiders spoke about me and how I felt about the world. This isn't a thing against foreigners, that is really not at all what this is about. But it's the same feeling I got when I went to one of those tourist trap beach resort places. I don't really get this fascination that people have with the ocean. There was a party boat pulling up and seeing a bunch of sunburnt Caucasians shaking their tushes to reggae songs about oppression and anguish made my stomach turn a bit. It's like this, this cannibalistic thing. It's like I'm being eaten. Do that. Those foreign exchange students can speak so boldly and confidently about the Jamaican experience, knowing that in a matter of months, they will return home. The fuzzy images of coconut trees and patty bags soon fading into an obscure memory of your wacky and wild college days, whereas those faded memories for me are and will remain my lived reality. When I say white supremacists in form, I'm referring to that feeling. Like you're a pawn in someone else's chessboard. An obscure, blurred image in the background of another's photograph. 
It's when the feelings and experiences of the other only serve to propel the narrative of someone else. Even if that person is guilty, even if they know the unjustness of the position they hold, this is still their story. You are just a footnote in their story. I don't think any of these films or TV shows are bad in isolation. It is only in the larger picture that they get ugly. They were born out of corruption, exist in corruption, and ultimately while they critique themselves, they will ultimately serve to perpetuate that corruption. I don't think it's a coincidence that we all of a sudden got a surge of stories involving the same theme in the year of the Hollywood strikes and the repeated failures of massive budget blockbusters. Look at it, they don't build theaters like this anymore. Look at this place. The cradle's been rocking and the tide's been turning. On the Golden Globes and Academy Awards, you've been getting a lot of first. <laughs> Though this is also at a time when the overall viewership of these awards is lower than ever. This essay is probably called something like The Last Era of White Guild Cinema, and to tell you the truth, this might be one of those pretty pink bows I spoke about in my last video, but this does genuinely feel to me like the last cry of an epoch on the brink of collapse. Consider it this way, you didn't know that I had this place, and you didn't know that I lost it. For whatever my knowledge of film history is worth, this all feels familiar. And I suspect, like in the late 60s, we are on the cusp of another massive shift. But this time, maybe better? You gotta tell me. Were we supposed to eat the turkey? <laughs> so the slicing of the meat is me giving pieces of myself to people. And as a native person, that's basically what you're doing. And whether people choose to eat it is totally up to them. So beautiful. Spoilers for the curse, I imagine the least people have seen this one, that has to change. If you can stomach Pete cringe, I recommend this show wholeheartedly, in spite of, you know, everything we've been talking about. But, and this might be recency bias, the show has one of the best finales I've seen of any series, including Seinfeld, including Evangelion. The curse can feel like a roller coaster to watch, and not always in a good way, but this finale retroactively makes everything click. The Curse has always had a dreamlike atmosphere without anything actually supernatural or otherworldly happening. Okay. How many now? How many? I don't know. But when all of a sudden Asher wakes up on the ceiling of his bedroom, it doesn't make even the slightest bit of sense, but it works. Asher suddenly having his gravitational pull reversed is one of the strangest choices I have seen in a show. Okay. And it is played exactly as it would happen in real life. What's going on? Oh, no. what? Whitney and Asher trying to figure out what the absolute hell is going on, all complicated with Whitney then going into labor, is one of the most simultaneously frightening and hilarious things I've seen. After the shock wore off, I think I actually got it. <laughs> Most people seem confused, and there are many different interpretations which I have deliberately avoided, because I have an interesting one of my own which happens to conveniently serve my thesis. The reason I talk about this as a part of the resolution is because Asher and Whitney are getting a taste of what it feels like to be on the other end. They are in a strange situation that truthfully makes no logical sense, but it is very real and they are helpless in this. Whitney has to go to the hospital because she's a baby. Trust me. Yes. So Asher, after having foolishly gone outside, is stuck up a tree. If he lets go, curtains. Dougie comes to help him, but he assumes Asher climbed up the tree. My dad did the same thing. He was weak, you know, I blamed him for everything. Doggy's father ran out on him, so he projects that experience onto Asher, believing he's just running away from fatherhood in spite of Asher explicitly telling him that he will float away and die if he lets go. To me about your fear about becoming a dad? Of course, everyone thinks he's either crazy or exaggerating. Inevitably, 
in a scene that is both hilarious and bone chilling. I need a net covering me from the top that is anchored to the fire truck. The fire brigade does all they believe best and saws the crazy man off the branch while he is desperately telling them not to do that. You have to tell them to stop! Ducky, please! Stop him! As his son is being born, Asher rockets into orbit, never to be seen or heard from again. Doggy is left weeping in despair as in his attempts to help his friend, he only ended up hurting him. Maybe instead of doing what he, in the depths of his ignorance, thought best, Doggy should have listened. What the finale of The Curse illustrates is the dangers of white guilt art and centering yourself over those you claim to support. Whitney and Asher's strange situation shows the audience, who has grown attached to these horrible white people, what it feels like to have other people talk over you and belittle your experience in favor of their perception. These stories' crime is time and time again centering the aggressor and their feelings rather than those who are hurt by them. The curse flips that on its head. It is odd, it is bizarre, it is surreal, but that's going to happen when you make truly subversive art. Well, I invited you, but I didn't really expect you to come. How long have you been there? You brought a lot of people. You have a different way of making movies. And, mm. and I came here to find out how it works. And you just announced that it doesn't. I don't think it does. I spoke about my past with the gender stuff, but what ruined me when it comes to capitalism and colonialism was when it really sank in that it is systemically illegal for me to have access to art. All the pictures in the theaters where I live are American. All from Hollywood. Scorsese enraged the big nerds when he allegedly attacked the MCU for not being cinema, but what he was really talking about was capitalism. I like films like Raging Bull and Kills of the Flower Moon, but I have to come to terms with the fact that we'll have whatever latest cash grab Disney churns out for at least three months before we can get a smaller film which will likely show for a week or two at most. In contradiction to that, I happen to catch all of the 2023 films spoken about today in theaters. Though they were all gone within a week, except maybe Barbie and the next one. For us, a film like Oppenheimer or Killers is small. So you know we're not getting most of the stuff which are being awarded Oscars shown at all. I was actually the only one in the theater when I was watching Killers. Because of this disparity, I did initially have a stubborn, snobbish resentment of superhero stuff, which I've since grown out of, mostly. The real problem that Scorsese has with Disney's amusement park films is that they've taken over the theater. Though truth be told, the argument could be made that films like those Scorsese makes have taken over the awards ceremonies. The Golden Globes recently had to invent a category to acknowledge Barbara's achievement as the cultural event of the year. The point I'm trying to make is that Oppenheimer doesn't deserve to not have his story told. I don't think there's any art that should not exist. But this is the system which has been in place for the bulk of Western civilization. Another post-Oscars update, because what happened that night just further illustrates my point. Three of the Best Picture nominees were about genius sides, and one of them won half the awards, including Best Picture. I need you to understand, I cannot possibly call Oppenheimer bad art. I resonated with it too strongly to do something like that. But on that very night, around the time Ryan Gosling dazzled us with his Ken Sun performance. People lost their lives. When Killian was being handed a little golden man for playing someone who helps to create a massacre, real people were being massacred at that very moment. As well made and beautiful as their art may be, I think the fundamental issue at play here can be found in that image of the wealthy performers patting each other on the back 
while real people are living the struggle. This theater is coming down tomorrow. Are you aware of that? What a shame. What more is there to say? In the current system, within the current zeitgeist, we will always be trapped. Stories should not have to compete with each other to exist. One form must no longer be the default. But having said all that, I'm choosing optimism and saying I think things are already shifting. Stop what you're doing and stop Spider-Man. You Miles, the black one! Things I was grateful to see in theaters this year. Holy hell, this one molly wops the rest. As mentioned before, I have had a past of being biased against superhero stuff, but I've always loved Spider-Man. Spider-Man is everyone's boy. As Stan Lee says, anyone can wear the mask. Spider-Man is an awkward teenager with spider powers whose central conflict has always been reconciling his divine responsibilities with his mortal desires. You know the thing, been by a radioactive spider, aunt, uncle, whoever dies, prompting him to take his thing more seriously. There's a love interest we must emotionally neglect, all the kind of events. The story's been told time and time again, in different formats, with different versions. <laughs> Somehow, never with a black guy until the picture of Donald Glover, of all people, went viral. So they made a comment with a black kid as a web slinger, and would you believe the neckbeards got mad because of that? So what they did with the movies was double down on the theme of canon and who does and doesn't get to wear the mask, birthing one of the most immediately beloved superhero movies of all time, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Anyone can wear the mask. You could wear the mask. Miles Morales, our boy, must learn to use his powers as he interacts with and faces villains from other dimensions, beating other versions of him. What would follow up this movie was the modern classic, immediate masterpiece, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Call it recency bias all you want, I genuinely think this is one of the greatest animated movies of all time, possibly the most important one since Toy Story. I'm saying this as someone whose favorite movie is animated. This one is for the history books. And the million and one animators and styles used in this film are not just for the flair of it. The story... This story expands on the conversation of its predecessor and challenges the idea of the canon. Each and every one of these characters is Spider-Man. No matter the race, gender, species, time period, they are all Spider-Man. From the racial subtext to the queer subtext, which is not even a debate, guys. Is Being captain, this whole thing doesn't matter anymore. You're the best thing I've ever done. This movie challenges cultural hegemony by challenging how we view the Spider-Man story and form. Everyone keeps telling me how my story is supposed to go. Nah, I'm gonna do my own thing. Miles follows Spider-Gwen into another universe where he cramps everyone's style apparently by existing. He is then put in trial when he inevitably commits the unforgivable sin of saving people. Miles, you disrupted a canon event. Each and every one of these Spider-Men have undergone the canon events I mentioned earlier of having someone close to them die after being put in some moral dilemma, and Miles saves Indian Spider-Man from this trauma. The scoundrel. Miguel, head of the Spider Society, will not have this. That's why anomalies are so dangerous. You weren't supposed to be there. When Miles is taken to the Spider Society, he is made aware of all of this, also learning that he's doing kind of an event himself. My dad is about to be captain. Naturally, the boy wants to save his father, but apparently, breaking the canon risks the collapse of society as a whole. And on top of that, he learns that he wasn't really, quote unquote, supposed to be his universe's Spider-Man either. He must undergo this necessary trauma because those are the rules. But who makes the rules? Why must we follow these arbitrary rules? He has powers, he's doing his thing. Why is that a problem? Just because he doesn't align with one set of people's construct of how the world is supposed to work? Breaking the canon may risk the collapse of society, but if that society sucks and you can do something to change it, I don't know, maybe a bit of chaos, frightening as it is, may not be so bad. There will always be a theater, and it may very well be a healthy thing 
that the old-fashioned theater is done away with. I've tried to make the point that we are doing away with a form of slavery. Currently, the Bob Marley biopic is showing and making its rounds. It's an American Hollywood film, and in the Hollywood canon, it will likely amount to just another one of the numerous Oscar Beatty biopics you've been getting too much of recently. However, in Jamaica, as you can imagine, it's a bit bigger of a deal than that. Probably the most mainstream film about Jamaica and Jamaican culture since maybe ever. They've been promoting it for a full year. The first time I saw the trailer, probably when I went to watch Oppenheimer actually, <laughs> I won't sugarcoat it, my eyes swelled up a bit. Seeing people and streets and sounds that are familiar to me being projected onto a large screen brought about an emotion that I was not expecting. As of recording, this is the most packed that cinemas have ever been. They are having a stupid amount of showings per day, and they're all getting booked out. The premiere was a massive red carpet event, blocking off main roads, there were concerts, government officials were there, even Dan Prince Harry was there. Why they invited the colonizers instead of me, I'll never know. But this was and is a massive, massive deal for us, but it's... Still an American film casted with mostly British actors. Probably the reason it was able to exist in the first place. Hell, probably even why us Jamaicans chose to support it. Another bittersweet thing about how long this essay took to make is that all of this was initially written before I had had the chance to see it myself. And believe me, I... <laughs> I have thoughts. After watching that thing, I have a new appreciation for the critics of Killers of the Flower Moon and Barbie. The form of the biopic is ideologically western in its individualist approach, which betrays the power of the collective struggle which this particular story is supposed to be exploring. Check my Patreon or Instagram for the full breakdown. But instead of dedicating a video to this or speaking about local films, I have, once again, chosen to make a probably two hour long video talking about guilty white people. But would you have clicked had I been speaking about that instead? Hey, we are bullshit. We are not bullshit. We are bullshit. It's all fucking nothing. We're nothing. Having said all that, I think we're getting better. I call this the last era because I think the shift has already happened. You have to have the ability in your head to not care. And you have to have the ability in your head to just make stuff. I want to challenge how we view art. There's all these rules and conventions and ways to make movies. You, you have all these arbitrary roles that were invented back in the 30s and we still use them. You, everything you hear about filmmaking is a suggestion. Sometimes we forget stories don't even need protagonists. That's a construct. The films spoken about today are great, but that's still a construct. They're great at executing stories a certain way for a certain demographic, and on this particular corner of the internet we sometimes forget that this is just one speck of the large totality of what films, even stories as a whole, look like. Hell, not everyone even watches movies, much less the types that win bogus American awards. In school, you should be making movies, not, not letting the professor tell you about Eisenstein and D.W. Griffiths. And in the fa in the fa there are more very diverse stories getting platformed with visibility than ever before. I think that the internet is the way forward, though of course it's in its trash era. I can't say certain words here without fear of demonetization. I must manufacture several layers of authenticity while trying to appease an audience. There's lots of problems. But the cradle is rocking. Filmmakers like Joel Haver challenged Scorsese's war about the future of cinema by making beautiful films funded by fans made free for anyone to watch whenever they want. 13 year olds on TikTok find inventive new ways to waste time by developing editing techniques that challenge anything that has ever been put to cinemas or television. Even if you get more traditional with it, we have platforms like Movie, Curiosity Stream, Nebula, which prioritize platforming distinct diverse creative voices. Now, of course you must see films, and you must see great films. Well, I said don't, don't be marinated, don't soak yourself. The argument against what I'm saying is that the world is full. All the best young directors are soaked in films. And they have managed to rise above that and to be remarkable cineasts. Yes. You are in the presence of a speaker 
who is not only paradoxical, but confused. But to avoid the heartache that my Barbie video caused me, I must stress that capitalism still haunts us. Exploitation of attention by advertisers, the monetization of self and perception of self, political radicalization and polarization as I suggested earlier. Even the algorithms on most of these platforms are racist and have been racist. This is a cesspool run right now, <laughs> let's be real. But I think the cradle is rocking. What I'm saying is not a literal, let's abandon the theaters and pull out the cell phones. F***ing telephone. But what it is is that I think we need to start getting comfortable with the idea that the way things are and were has hindered the potential for how and whose stories can be told. We need to move away from an era where the cinema has been enslaved by one group of people only occasionally being infiltrated by others who make all the same mistakes by trying to be like them. This is all a very new frontier we're dealing with and it's very frightening and trash right now. But that's what every large scale shift looks like in its infancy. As much as we may complain, this is a damn good thing we have and hopefully it will only get better so we can truly finally say farewell to stories that feel guilty for existing, embracing the oddities of those previously untold and unheard. I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to do now. I've always been stereotypical Barbie and I don't think I'm really good at anything else. Barbie ends with stereotypical Barbie departing the world of artifice to enter that of imperfection. Her familiar, idyllic standard is what is comforting, but after all that mess, it becomes overwhelmingly clear how fundamentally flawed it all is. I don't I think that things should go back to the way that they were. Ideas live forever. Humans, not so much. Being a human can be pretty uncomfortable. I know. Stereotypical, white supremacist, male gaze barb realizes that it is time for her to go. So she departs from that which she knows. My unique take on that ending, whatever it's worth, is an acknowledgement that that which we know original Barbie with all her baggage should be removed from the center of conversation in favor of a different, perhaps scarier, but potentially better future. Support the revolution and join my Patreon. Endings are a great American preoccupation and happy endings which is really what you're looking for because you're a sentimentalist. Happy endings depend on stopping the story before it's over. All comedies end in marriage and all tragedies end in death. As far as this movie is concerned, it seems to me you've got your ending. Why? Because we have come to the end. Cut. <laughs>